All right, so we'll get this webinar started. Welcome again to this IAS USA webinar. Today is Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. My name is Jose Francisco, and I'm a project manager here at IAS USA. We are excited to cover today's presentation on simplifying treatment of hepatitis C and overcoming barriers to cure. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Andrew Aronson, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago Medicine. We'll go over our introduction slides and we'll moderate our Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Welcome, Dr. Aronson. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, it's just a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the IAS USA uh, for the invitation to moderate uh, with a great talk by Dr. Kim uh, entitled Simplifying Treatment of Hepatitis C and Overcoming Barriers to Cure. Next slide. Um, here is our uh, financial uh, relationship disclosures uh, for our content of the web board on the web board. Uh, as far as financial relationships uh, from Dr. Kim, uh, has served on the Data Safety Monitoring Board for Kintour Pharmaceuticals, and I do not have any uh, financial relationships to relevant financial relationships to disclose. Uh, CME uh, is available for this great presentation uh, uh, through IAS uh, USA. Uh, you will be eligible for 1.25 AMA PRA uh, Category 1 credits. Uh, as well as ABI, ABIM MOC credits, nursing contact hours, pharmacotherapy credits, as well as pharmacy contact hours of 0.125 CEU. Uh, and here is uh, our grant support uh, that is listed, as you can see here. Uh, this will be, although this is a live webinar now, this will be an on-demand recording, uh, and the slides will be available within 24 hours. Uh, and you can see the uh, uh, website in order to access those, those slides uh, listed in front of you. Uh, this is important. This is just a few housekeeping uh, issues as far as navigating this activity. If you're new to uh, our webinars, first, there'll be poll questions, and you'll see those that will open up as a separate window uh, that will show you the poll questions and choose your responses. Please try to participate because it makes uh, the webinar better for everyone. Uh, if you would like to submit a question and we would encourage you to submit questions, uh, please submit those using the Q&A button. Uh, we're gonna do our best to try to address all of the questions and even pull together similar questions. So please uh, stay tuned at the end of Dr. Kim's uh, presentation, we'll get to them. Uh, you can use the chat uh, to start a discussion with other attendees, but don't use the chat to submit uh, questions. Uh, we're going to primarily or solely use the Q&A. So use the Q&A if, if you have any specific questions. All right. And without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce uh, my colleague and, and friend, Dr. Arthur Kim, uh, who is an expert in hepatitis C. Uh, he is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, and I'm delighted to uh, be able to listen to his talk entitled Simplifying Treatments for Hepatitis C and Overcoming Barriers to Cure. Thanks so much, Arthur. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Andrew and uh, to the IAS USA for uh, inviting me to give this uh, seminar and uh, also uh, immense thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy days to um, join us. And so um, uh, whether it's good morning or good afternoon or um, perhaps even the evening, um, uh, we uh, welcome. So as mentioned, uh, I'm privilege to speak on, on this topic, which uh, represents sort of where we are in, in 2022, where we have achieved both uh, treatment regimens that have matured and have been uh, in widespread use and are uh, largely can be simplified for the vast majority of individuals. However, there still remains barriers. Um, and so uh, to speak on those issues, um, we'll uh, have a case that, that um, uh, begins to illustrate those as well as some potential solutions. So we'll begin with a uh, audience response poll. So uh, using the, um, the Zoom poll, uh, how many patients uh, living with hepatitis C virus would you encounter in a given year? Would you see greater than 100, 50 to 100, 25 to 49, 10 to 24, less than 10, or not relevant to me. Go 
give that another minute. Okay, as expected, um, we have um, some persons who are really in the thick of things in regards to uh, seeing patients uh, living with hepatitis C and really across the board. Uh, we also have um, uh, some folks who are not uh, necessarily involved in seeing patients directly, but interested in this webinar. And so, um, you know, we are we designed this webinar in part to have uh, tidbits that will be uh, clearly review for many of you who are um, seeing many patients, uh, but also um, hopefully for those of you who are just getting into hepatitis C care, um, some some pearls and tidbits. So, what we would like to uh, now, um, just in terms of learning objectives, is that at the uh, by the end of this webinar, you'd be able to describe the recent advances in the treatment of hepatitis C, which now date back um, sort of five, six years, but um, we uh, now can treat and cure uh, greater than 95% of uh, all individuals. We'll also talk about the current barriers that remain in the treatment of hepatitis C, and in particular, as it relates to uh, elimination. Now, when we're talking about elimination, the, the WHO has set some goals. So um, uh, you may not be following this that closely, but this is a pretest question. So take, take a, a guess at um, what is the goal set for um, treating all those identified and living with hepatitis C? Is it 95%? Is it 80%? Is it 60%? Or is it 25%? Again, give you uh, 30 seconds or so to give an answer. Ninety-five percent is the um, modal answer, uh, and so um, and I'm glad that really none of you chose the, the really unambitious goal of only treating twenty-five percent of those living so with hepatitis C. We'll go over that during the presentation. So, which of these groups would be eligible for what we call simplified treatment regimens for hepatitis C virus? Is it persons living with HIV? Is it pregnant persons? Is it persons with compensated cirrhosis? Is it persons living with hepatitis B co-infection or who are surface antigen positive? We'll see the answers in a few moments. Great, so uh, we, we do have a, um, uh, uh, two answers that kind of rose to the top, persons living with HIV um, and those living with compensated cirrhosis. And um, I know this audience, uh, uh, the IAS USA audience, uh, often are also involved in the care of persons living with HIV. And so, um, it, yes, uh, we can um, treat patients with HIV and, and those are indeed um, uh, sort of one of the strengths of what we're doing in this country in terms of moving towards elimination. Um, but we'll go over the correct answer when we reach the slide. All right, well, let's kind of anchor the discussion in the case. And so I'm presenting an 18 year old woman I saw a few years back who had initially presented to a psychiatric hospital for inpatient detoxification from opioids. She has post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so just one year ago, she had initiated opioids. She had been, uh, she had been tested and uh, knew that she was hepatitis C negative just six months earlier. Uh, while beginning with inhaled modes of um, uh, administration, she moved to uh, intravenous and uh, just three months earlier. And she tests hepatitis C antibody negative. Uh, she describes using clean needles and syringes each use, but did share some equipment with her boyfriend who told her that he's hepatitis C negative. Um, she didn't see the test result. And so um, we are looking now at the um, uh, her, her ALT, which is 16 and in the normal range. And then um, the serologies are also negative for HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B, other things that you might be testing for. She remains very concerned that um, something may be up and she may have hepatitis C and requests both ALT and RNA testing after doing some research on her own on the internet. Uh, and two and a half weeks later, uh, she remains hepatitis C and body negative, but her ALT has risen to 435, highly abnormal. 
Um, she's not jaundiced, by the way. Uh, and her hepatitis C RNA, which was requested, is positive. So two and a half weeks later is actually very soon, uh, perhaps even sooner than, than I, who uh, would test, because I'm a very aggressive tester in the setting, but she must have been worried about an exposure. What she is diagnosed with is acute hepatitis C. And so she is a, um, was previously negative uh, and now positive and clear, is a clear-cut case of a new case. Uh, and given that she's 18 and has a pretty uh, uh, short period of, of risk, uh, this, this is the uh, very earliest stage of hepatitis C. And when we're talking about the earliest stage, uh, the, there are two potential outcomes, and the first one is shown here. But uh, also shown on this graph is the idea of the incubation phase. And it generally takes even behind this, this time zero uh, a few weeks uh, to incubate and may appear later. It, as this um, woman did not have uh, risk factors uh, while in the facility, but um, was worried about exposures beforehand. But then the RNA appears before the antibody. And as a reminder of the zero negative window, the ALT activity can be, uh, this says 100% of the maximal ALT, but the maximal ALT when measured can be quite variable. There are people who can reach the thousands, often jaundiced with, it, with really liver injury uh, and feeling ill with malaise and, and, and other um, more nonspecific symptoms. But others will have an ALT that, that may a double or triple, but they go from like 14 to 42 in some uh, serial measurements. In the end, uh, you can also clear the virus on your own. That results in the profile that you likely all encountered of hepatitis C antibody positivity and RNA negativity. And so um, you might be screening with an antibody and be in need of a hepatitis C uh, RNA follow-up and, and then the test is negative uh, in that instance. There's also um, the possibility shown here on the right. And you'll notice that the first part looks much the same. However, um, the antibodies do um, develop later with the same seronegative window. However, uh, patients may have uh, ALT activity that is now uh, above the upper limit of normal, and then uh, a new viral set point, so to speak. Um, generally, you know, in the hundreds of thousands to a million range, uh, that describes chronic hepatitis. And so that outcome is generally determined in the first uh, year for certain, but, but even more so in the first six months, about two thirds of individuals who clear the virus may end up um, uh, uh, clearing in the first six months uh, after their initial exposure. And so this binary outcome is uh, important to understand in that um, people do go on to viral clearance. And a common question at this point is that, you know, what happens to those with viral clearance? This is an RNA only virus. And so it, it truly is not in the body, uh, despite the antibody, which is just a marker of, of exposure. Uh, these individuals do have some protection against uh, similar strains if they're infected later, but are not guaranteed to clear the virus again. If they go on to chronic infection, which is uh, in classic textbook ratio, uh, four out of five individuals, many will have stable or slowly progressive liver disease for, for a long time and, and may, if you left them alone, not uh, suffer liver consequences. However, a good proportion do move on to cirrhosis, kind of a rule of thumb, maybe around 20% uh, over 20 years. And so the longer you have hepatitis C, the more you're at risk. And so when starting with a normal liver, um, this generally takes decades and not the few seconds of inflammation here, there's this sort of smoldering inflammation that occurs that eventually may result in cirrhosis and the downstream consequences of liver failure, meaning uh, esophageal varices, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, very serious uh, issues, as well as hepatocellular carcinoma and potentially mortality. And so these are obvious outcomes to avoid that my friend uh, Andrew Aronson, as a hepatologist, I'm an infectious disease expert, um, we collaborate on uh, trying to avoid those outcomes. And so the cofactors related to the liver, which could be a talk in and of its own, um, are uh, things such as alcohol use. We counsel patients living with hepatitis C to at least minimize or uh, do harm reduction in the sense of alcohol minimization. Uh, avoid a co-infections with HIV, which accelerates the process uh, on average about 10 years. Um, so rather than a 20, 30 year disease, it can be as low as 10 to 20 years. And then hepatitis B co-infection, you, you also want to avoid. And so immunization of hepatitis B is critical. And then uh, the co-epidemic in our country of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH or um, uh, issues related to metabolic syndrome and obesity is, are also important. What's 
interesting when you think about it from both a national and international perspective is that uh, here you're seeing sort of the number of deaths uh, through the 90s and 2000s and sort of the, the great concern and as HIV was uh, uh, not yet addressed worldwide, but with uh, the rollout of um, PEPFAR and sort of other um, uh, methods to uh, curb HIV in the absence of a vaccine, uh, we were um, able to see deaths decline. And so you can just imagine if that curve kept going up. We also also seen some uh, some improvements in tuberculosis related burden of mortality as well as malaria, but what we haven't seen yet is uh, chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C addressed um, in the sense that we do have the tools to both prevent uh, with vaccine for hepatitis B as well as treat as well. And in hepatitis C, there's prevention in terms of harm reduction, clean needles, etc., and um, and also highly curative treatments. And yet. These are projected to increase if we do not upscale both screening of identifying this largely silent killer um, of uh, actually both hepatitis B and C are each silent killers um, and, um, and roll out treatment to as many as possible. And so this is just a, another visualization of, um, of that hepatitis keeps rising, a more simplified version. Um, and so what would it mean to eliminate hepatitis C? Now, this would be very difficult. You can see that we're having trouble with a lot of other viruses, um, you know, other than smallpox. Um, we, we, we've had um, a, a very much difficulty eliminating viruses and you can even hear about polio uh, in New York City, how difficult this is. But when we think about hepatitis C, there's, there's really a major burden. 71 million people um, per last estimation, um, 400,000 deaths per year, uh, liver failure, liver cancer. United States still a uh, number of millions of persons in, infected and prior to uh, COVID-19 was perhaps the leading single infectious cause of death that has since uh, been surpassed. But um, the World Health Organization therefore set global elimination targets for hepatitis C. So one is a reduction in incidence of new infections via needle um, uh, safety, both in terms of hospitals and healthcare, as well as uh, in uh, high-risk individuals, such as persons who inject drugs, 80% of those uh, eligible treated. Now, many of you chose the 95% uh, global elimination target, and I would agree if we were working really towards elimination of the virus, that would be necessary. What, we're, what elimination means here is the elimination of hepatitis C as a public health problem, meaning, uh, meaning that hepatitis C would become rare enough that the burden um, would not uh, stress our health systems nearly as much as they, they do. And then um, we'd expect a lag time between eliminating the virus in all of the population, 80% uh, of those treated, to um, the liver-related mortality, since many are already at risk. But hopefully, we would achieve a 65% reduction. And so the correct answer in this case would be 80% of those treated as a, as a realistic but um, uh, a reachable uh, goal. Um, um, so how do we do this? Um, well, it's, you know, the treatment has been the, the real um, advance. And, and so uh, this is showing the life cycle again of the virus. And so we've thought a lot about life cycles of viruses in the last couple of years. Um, and in recent uh, 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 terms, the hepatitis C here avoids the nucleus. It never has a DNA intermediate, which is really, again, uh, emphasizing that it is a curable disease. And so um, sometimes when we're counseling patients, they say, oh, my antibody's still positive. That means I still have it. Um, it's import important in my counseling to, to emphasize the difference between the RNA test, which indicates um, active disease or active infection versus the um, antibody. Um, but then we can target um, protease and, um, uh, and viral polymerase, and um, as well as a, a protein known as NS5A involved in the assembly and release of the virus. And so um, choosing two of these targets, as we learned uh, from HIV, is more <coughs> efficient than hepatitis C. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, more efficient than choosing one uh, uh, monotherapy. And so in combination, we can cure hepatitis C using two of these agents. And what we saw is moving from interferon era to somewhere I could do, use a lot of slides to, to illustrate this, but what we really saw was a evolved regimen. So increasing efficacy shown by the height, um, but we're reaching this issue of um, having uh, really potent um, regimens that can cure within eight to 10 weeks of administration. Uh, there's little resistance cost. Um, uh, there's uh, a pangenotypic, meaning all the genotypes, the different families of hepatitis C were covered, uh, that it's tolerable and safe, uh, which uh, will, it has been shown. 
once daily to uh, we learned that from the HIV where, where when people were swallowing um, handfuls of pills uh, multiple times a day, of course, a once daily regimen would be great. Shorter duration of eight to 12 weeks, a few drug drug interactions would be idealized and then a, a lower cost, um, which uh, uh, initially was not the case, but uh, has been achieved through negotiations and through novel models. So the response rates for uh, one of these regimens is, um, uh, which is sofosivir plus velpatosphere. So uh, shown in uh, purple is the sofosivir and velpatosphere is the NS5A inhibitor. And together these achieved in these various genotypes uh, between um, for genotypes one, two, four, five, six, uh, 97 to 100% um, uh, response. There are even persons living with cirrhosis and some people who had previously not responded to interferon-based therapies and did excellently. Now we see that um, uh, for genotype three that are there, uh, and having cirrhosis, there is a slight um, a decrease in um, efficacy, um, but nonetheless, um, as this still qualifies very much as a, as a pan-genotypic regimen. So for those, particularly without cirrhosis, I mean, we're really talking about uh, 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 levels of cure. Now, um, there was an eight-week arm of phase two trial, which wasn't quite uh, as efficacious, and so we do uh, advise 12 weeks for this regimen. Now, the eight-week regimen that uh, we looked at um, is guacapavir, or a protease inhibitor. If you, there's a PR in the name, if you want to try to remember which, which is which. And then the pibrantesvir, or uh, with the, uh, which is the NS5A inhibitor, this pangenotypic regimen first looked at eight weeks versus 12 weeks, um, since, since we had largely used 12 weeks um, prior to this. Um, and then even the eight week regimen did quite well in both mono infected patients and in um, a handful, as you can see here, 33 co-infected patients, everyone was cured. And even some sofosivir experienced patients. Now in, in general, I won't go over the, the details of how to treat um, DAA experienced patients, but in this case, um, these three were cured. Now, um, eight weeks GP also uh, in, a, in a parallel trial achieved excellent results in um, genotype three patients. And so, uh, and um, uh, just looking at their uh, adverse event profile or the safety, um, really, while a number of individuals would report something going on, um, any adverse event during the study periods, you can see how low the rates are leading to study drug discontinuation. So of these 700 people, only one really had to stop anything. Serious AEs and death occurred, but uh, none of them were deemed to be related to the DAA um, and did not result in discontinuation. There is some headache fatigue, looking uh, both in these studies and the package insert. We also often describe insomnia and sort of some other issues um, when um, talking with patients uh, about these agents. But in the end, uh, often the first week or two, they may experience these, but um, uh, I tell the patients to hydrate and often these uh, attenuate or subside over time. And uh, this uh, study looked at uh, GP or um, clocapavir and Tasvir versus uh, just for eight weeks for those with cirrhosis. And you can see again, really excellent results uh, for patients who had never been treated before. And so this results in this being a pan-genotypic regimen. Uh, we um, uh, don't have many patients represented here with genotypes five or six, but there, there are other studies which in aggregate uh, verify the, the uh, ability to cure pan-genotypically or for all genotypes. And so uh, this has resulted in uh, just in general, the, the uh, availability of highly effective and safe regimens. The idea is to treat those, um, to reduce the downstream mortality and liver related health consequences, achieve a virologic cure. The other thing not mentioned here uh, and will be important later to discuss is the uh, concept of treating as prevention. We know of this from HIV, right? We suppress individuals to undetectable, uh, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. And we consider that the same thing for hepatitis C. Um, now, treatment is therefore recommended in pretty much all patients. You know, um, the patient that we described um, earlier um, had risk factors um, for acquisition and um, you know, uh, could share uh, equipment in the future. And so uh, while she is many, many years away from the liver disease consequences, there are uh, reasons to treat um, early. Now, the, why wouldn't you treat? That was actually one of the questions um, submitted. So, um, every once in a while, you meet someone living with hepatitis C who will have some 
some other issue threatening uh, life, such as um, end-stage cancer or uh, poor prognosis cancer. And so hepatitis C may remain on the back burner. Now there are individuals at cancer centers who are aggressively treating hepatitis C as it can get in the way of a lot of issues. It, it, it can be important to stage these individuals' livers uh, if you're not treating um, just so they can tolerate um, chemotherapy. Again, a pretty specialized situation, but that cancer centers, uh, people such as um, Dr. Thomas at MD Anderson and, and others are, are um, deeply involved in. So patients um, uh, with these short uh, life expectancies, uh, you can consult an expert, but um, if you can remediate it by liver transplantation, that's an exception to that rule. So persons who are decompensated um, and may be eligible for treatment, and that really is a judgment call based on the transplant center and where the patient's at. How do we stage patients? This could be a talk in and of its own, and uh, I have to uh, condense this really into one slide. Um, but um, I showed you the, the movement from a, a healthy looking liver to cirrhosis earlier. Um, we, we would like to um, advise that for most patients, um, they do um, get some sort of evaluation for uh, advanced fibrosis. Now, this can be as simple as uh, using a platelet count and a couple of other measurements. Um, and also uh, a bit of common sense, the 18 year old woman is, unless she had some sort of underlying liver disease of youth, uh, really has an extremely low chance of having anything but F0 fibrosis or no fibrosis. Um, but um, for those who have been living with hepatitis C sooner, we, we do want to stage and provide some prognostic level um, for uh, advice regarding um, uh, you know, the urgency of treatment for one thing for in, in, in terms of the liver, but also um, for future screening for liver disease, et cetera. So when we talk about simplified regimens, um, what um, evidence do we have that they might work? So, so I've already told you that you know, genotype may uh, be treated uh, or uh, all genotypes may be treated. And so this study uh, performed within the AIDS clinical trials group, uh, the MINMON study or minimal monitoring, uh, the, the mantra or the philosophy is to keep hepatitis C as, as simplified as possible. So here what we're doing is um, no need for pretreatment genotyping. Um, the study can look at baseline samples and genotype later. Um, but um, in terms of clinical practice, why would you need it when you have a sophosphorus-reveal patosphere? You can provide all 84 tablets at entry. So that's very different than the way we practice in the United States, often providing uh, four weeks at a time. Now, there are no scheduled on-treatment clinic or labs. The safety um, was shown very well early on uh, in the rollout of these agents. Uh, we'd often bring patients in for week four RNA, sometimes mandated by insurers. But uh, this study did not include any of that. It did include a remote contact, just kind of checking in. Um, this, um, you can see uh, at weeks four and 22, these were also to enhance the likelihood that some patients would come back for study visits and um, uh, be engaged with the study. Now, the exclusions are those who are pregnant, those who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive or co-infected with hepatitis B. Those were um, not selected for um, minimal monitoring and persons with evidence of decompensation, which as mentioned in, uh, in the last couple of slides involve um, specialized care. And so who was in this study? So uh, there were patients who were found to be ineligible for whatever reason, who didn't return for their enrollment visit. What's nice about the study as well is that while it included patients from uh, places like the United States, uh, such as the majority of you practicing, it included um, uh, sites in Brazil, Thailand, Uganda, and South Africa, and who all initiated SoftVail, again, handed all 84 pills and instructed to take one pill once a day. And you can see that um, a couple people actually in the United States didn't come back uh, before uh, their SVR evaluation. That is something that happens in clinical practice. But uh, here they were able to get excellent um, follow-up and get, uh, uh, and, the, and what is the efficacy? I'm sorry, I've not described this yet. And so for those of you beginning to hepatitis C, it's what we call an SVR or a sustained virologic response, which is um, negative virus, uh, cleared virus, 12 weeks after the cessation of treatment. And so what were the cure rates in this study, now published in the Lancet uh, Gastro and Hep? Um, so um, we're missing data on three of the participants, so the SVR rate could actually be higher. But you can see of the, the samples that were collected um, uh, that we had a 95%. Um, so this very pragmatic approach of uh, basically minimal monitoring of patients actually worked. And so this is part of the evidence base for uh, simplified regimens. And so
So we'll uh, talk about the simplified regimen algorithms that are available through the AASLD uh, and IDSA, a joint venture um, that um, uh, I was privileged to be on um, uh, years back and uh, Andrew as well. But uh, who is eligible for these simplified hepatitis C treatments? And so this gets at the um, patients who uh, uh, we would not really just um, do uh, this sort of simplified counseling. So those with prior hepatitis C treatment, particularly with DAAs, you do want to kind of have a more uh, close look at them in terms of what might be going on. And there are regimens. Um, if you look at the tabs up there for treatment experience individuals, uh, there is an um, uh, uh, audience question about that. But um, our focus right now is on the simplified regimens for those who are treatment naive or never had treatment before. And so um, now it says cirrhosis here, but I'm gonna show you in a moment, um, this is for the simplified treatment on this page. There are now simplified regimens for those living with cirrhosis. Those living with renal disease do have options, but um, uh, they do need to be uh, thought through a little bit more. HIV, while many of us in the, on this audience may be very um, facile with, with treating hepatitis C and the drug interaction potentials, um, generally, um, um, this is still not um, on the eligible um, simplified list. And so, um, and current pregnancy is not on the list. There's only a handful of patients who have been documented to be treated with DAAs and those with advanced liver disease. And so, um, uh, you know, what we're talking about once you pass uh, through that um, protocol for this particular simplified treatment regimen, you could use either the GP for eight weeks. Uh, now, uh, these are taken with food. I didn't remind you of that earlier. And so, uh, and then others can take sophosphorus rub patosphere. And so how do I choose between them? Actually, that food sometimes comes into play. So there are individuals who don't necessarily have reliable, um, uh, you know, food, they have food instability. Uh, and so, uh, so they might be uh, ones I might lean more towards the phosphor uh, There are other issues such as duration, um, uh, preference, uh, drug interactions that come into play when choosing between these. Now, what do we tell patients? Now, if they happen to be diabetic, there is this phenomenon as you cure the hepatitis C of hypoglycemia. So there's a bit of monitoring that occurs um, uh, that you just uh, tell them to monitor more closely. Uh, there's anticoagulation concerns. Um, now, uh, just no laboratory monitoring is required for, for as, as mentioned, and an in-person or telehealth phone visit may be indicated, not necessarily bringing the patient all the way in, you know, trying to keep it simple, so to speak. And so there are individuals that say that one would um, uh, uh, assess. Um, so SVR is uh, recommended uh, a check 12 weeks or later. And at that visit, uh, I often also measure an ALT to look to be sure if they were abnormal before that they normalize because it's very it's possible that they may have other liver insults, uh, as mentioned earlier, things such as the uh, NASH or metabolic syndrome. And so if those are elevated, they might be individuals that um, get uh, ongoing care for liver disease. But from a hepatitis C standpoint, they are done. So um, now, um, you know, uh, just as uh, this is just another way to look at it. Um, so pangenotypic regimens are available, do a drug-drug interaction check. Uh, there are a few to remember, such as statins for GP, uh, antacids um, that may be administered, co-administered with SOFL, but do need to be spaced apart. Um, uh, uh, or, uh, and then the option for, for uh, on-treatment monitoring and then the post-treatment assessment. Now um, there's uh, cirrhosis. So uh, those of you, this is now uh, the answer for the post-test question that, that there are simplified regimens available for those living with compensated cirrhosis. So how do you determine whether patients are compensated? So you can uh, classify them with uh, this score called the child's Q score. So basically if they have things such as ascites or encephalopathy, they, they raise their child Q score. Um, and then also those who are naive to therapy. Now, uh, liver biopsies are no longer required and there's still kind of a meme out there in the community that one needs a biopsy to be treated. Um, that's no longer true. So we, we often use these non-invasive measurements. The FIB4 uh, is a calculator that one can find on that hepatitis C guidelines website, as well as uh, other calculators found at the University of Washington hepatitis C site. Uh, uh, our um, health system will, uh, allows a dot phrase to rapidly calculate it within a note. But, um, and one can use these non-invasive tests, including a transient elastography or fibrosure or sort of other um, uh, tests. But, um, you know, looking on physical exam for evidence of cirrhosis, um, 
Uh, I should hesitate if being an infectious disease expert teaching on liver disease with a hepatologist in the room. Uh, prior liver biopsy showing cirrhosis usually is, is enough as well to qualify for cirrhosis, so or is enough. And so the regimens with uh, cirrhosis um, are pretty much GP, as I showed you earlier. You can use it for eight weeks now uh, for na patients naive to therapy. There is this issue with sofosterol, belpatosphere, and genotype 3 with baseline um, uh, uh, testing for uh, what we call resistance-associated substitutions or, or, um, uh, or polymorphisms that may result in decreased efficacy of, of sofosterol, belpatosphere. And so this Y93H mutation, this concept should be familiar to those of you involved in HIV care, but uh, if you're not involved in that, then uh, it's just a, a, a moment of pause for those with genotype 3 and cirrhosis. So in this uh, uh, person, um, going back to the case, is concerned that she may have hepatitis C and um, she gets the testing that I described earlier. Um, now at that time, um, you know, she uh, was still in, uh, in care, in inpatient care, transitioned to outpatient care for her uh, psychiatric and substance use issues. Um, while one could have treated her right away, uh, she ends up uh, waiting. And three months later, um, she still has an elevated ALT and the hepatitis C RNA is uh, not shown any evidence of clearing. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I could have thought about some different audience response questions. Would you treat her now or would you wait? But um, uh, we're, we're going to answer a different question, which is for this individual, um, let's say she's presenting in your jurisdiction, what do you think is the biggest barrier to hepatitis C virus treatment? This is an audience response without necessarily a correct answer. So let's think through this. So is it insurance coverage? Is it possible pregnancy? Is it the need for non-invasive fibrosis imaging, which has not occurred yet? Is it uh, re recent substance use? Is it marginal housing? So she, she isn't quite settled in, in sort of where she's living at the moment between her aunt's place and, and um, she was living in her car before her hospitalization. Give it a few more seconds and we'll see what the audience um, thinks. All right, so uh, the need for non-invasive fibrosis imaging was the lowest uh, response. And then uh, uh, you know, each of these other um, responses are, are highly uh, valid and concerns. Um, you know, she does have uh, recent substance use, and I hope to show you in the next slides how many individuals can indeed be treated uh, with a history of recent substance use, but you can still be concerned of it, about it as a barrier. Uh, and so um, that, that is a, a very valid answer here. Marginal housing, you know, how is she going to accomplish um, treatment? Uh, the meds while well, being able to be stored at room temperature, we, you know, we do want to not lose them, um, et cetera possible pregnancy. So I'm glad uh, this was brought up on uh, this. Uh, she's 18 and um, uh, she, I didn't describe it, but she is sexually active with her boyfriend while she's trying to be careful. Um, uh, you know, there's, there are potential barriers if they're on OCPs, for instance, with the GP regimen, but also like um, she is highly uh, eligible for treatment because let's say she became pregnant, there is a small um, chance that she would transmit to her child. And so there's a, yet another public health reason to think through um, uh, her treatment. And then insurance coverage for many of you would be an issue uh, depending on where you're at. So, uh, so I'm glad we did that exercise. Let's, let's run through some of these. So the major challenges to eliminating hepatitis C. So I described kind of uh, the rosy scenario where you have a patient uh, engaged in care, able to get simplified treatment, um, hopefully eligible and covered through their insurance. But there are a variety of barriers that remain. And if we're really going to eliminate hepatitis C in our country, we'll spend the next uh, sort of 20, 20 minutes or so going through this. So the virus is spreading silently. The majority of individuals don't know it uh, still, uh, despite expanded screening recommendations. Um, it um, causes liver fibrosis silently. It's unlikely to manifest except nonspecifically prior to um, uh, cirrhosis. Um, public health surveillance, depending where you're at, varies. So how are we going to eliminate if we're not counting cases well and counting how many cures are going on in various jurisdictions? Um, hepatitis C in uh, higher risk populations are often um, muted. Uh, the concern about it because there's other issues such as addressing the housing, addressing uh, just having medical coverage for issues getting linked to substance use care. 
And then um, hepatitis C does suffer a bit. There are some wonderful advocacy agencies and, and groups and individuals who are really working tirelessly, tirelessly to eliminate hepatitis C and, and raise the concern about it. Um, but uh, relative to say HIV, um, we, we do lack a bit of uh, the advocacy and, and sort of political allyship. Substances are a major issue. Uh, people who use drugs face uh, the stigma. They um, often are stigmatized and even traumatized by the healthcare system itself. So um, finding ways to uh, reduce stigma, both on an individual interaction level as well as on a systems level uh, becomes important. Uh, harm reduction is very available in our country. And so um, uh, depending on where your practice, and so those of you answered her, her substance use and, and getting that addressed, as a barrier is important. And then, then there are social um, issues, her own other social determinants of, of health, other issues such as incarceration and homelessness, um, care often being fragmented and in different systems and unable to talk to each other, sometimes due to confidentiality rules, et cetera. There's a provider shortage, and I hope this talk um, in some ways will, uh, I know many of you are already deeply engaged in this, but will um, inspire some some of you to, to enhance your uh, capacity to become a provider who is willing to treat and also willing to engage patients uh, who are uh, have some of these additional barriers. And then on a policy level, depending on um, where you are uh, as a state, and we'll go over some of those. Now, one issue that greatly helps, I think, is uh, hepatitis C screening. So uh, quite simply now, um, both um, earlier, the, the previous uh, groups, the Liver Disease Society and ID Society had already recommended um, uh, you know, one-time routine opt-out Hep C testing uh, for all adults, um, and then um, further testing for those, um, in this case, less than 18 uh, with behaviors, exposures, or conditions or circumstances associated with increased risk. We'll, we'll briefly go over those. Uh, and the U.S. Preventive Ta uh, Services Task Force, which is important uh, for um, uh, sort of a, a policy and, and having insurers on board, did uh, recommend this sort of at the beginning, March 2020, so it may have fallen under the radar for some of you uh, because of that timing uh, with the onset of COVID-19. So this list is the high risk group that would qualify for children, but also for um, uh, uh, individuals who should get more, more than one screening test. So let's say you test negative, like our individual earlier, she's still at risk. And so it's very reasonable to test uh, that uh, person again. And um, we typically uh, will test yearly, uh, although if they have risk factors or concerns, you know, they have an exposure, they shared with somebody, they normally don't share any equipment, but say, well, there was that one instance a few weeks ago, that might be another indication to, to test again. And uh, here you're seeing um, uh, injection drug use or people inject drugs um, as a major um, uh, risk factor, even intranasal use, use of other equipment that could be uh, contaminated. Um, men who have sex with men, and particularly those who are engaged in what we call chemsex, or a combining of drugs and sex. Um, risk, other risk exposures, which are becoming less common, thankfully, are shown here and include um, needle stick exposures, those on hemodialysis, although that's uh, become um, much safer over time. Um, children born to hep C infected women, those who were infected before we had screening tools with the blood supply. Uh, recall that this virus was just um, identified in 1989 and, and widespread screening begun in 1992. So incarceration as a risk factor, um, HIV infected individuals, uh, uh, those who are starting PrEP, uh, this is often included in, in PrEP packages of screening and, and those with ALT abnormalities. And so what are the solutions I described mostly problems in the last few slides. So let's uh, first begin by um, uh, advocating for more surveillance and monitoring. Our poor uh, public health people have lots on their hands, but um, uh, many are re-engaging in sort of hepatitis C work and, and um, seeing, you know, measuring how well people are testing and moving people along the cascade of care towards cure. Um, case finding and care coordination is a big part of moving along that cascade, increasing the screening and treatment capacity and increasing public awareness. And so this is just one example of uh, a study done just showing uh, different rates of liver-related mortality uh, that were higher in places such as Appalachia, uh, et cetera. Um, and so you can see this sort of pocket uh, compared to other neighboring areas, but there's still other areas with very high rates of um, liver-related mortality. Let's talk about briefly about prevention. And so testing is a big part of that, uh, the patients knowing their status and, and um, 
uh, is important and knowing their RNA status even more so. Um, vaccine, unfortunately, we uh, don't yet have a vaccine for hepatitis C. There was one um, uh, tested rec uh, recently uh, and published in the New England Journal. Um, Kim Page and Andrea Cox are the lead um, uh, uh, leads on that trial. Um, and then, uh, but harm reduction does work. Uh, I wish I could spend more time on how well it works, but those engaged in uh, harm reduction, both uh, clean uh, needles and, and equipment, as well as uh, uh, on opioid agonist therapies, those are things such as methadone and uh, suboxone, those um, do uh, work to prevent hepatitis C. And then thinking about treatment as a role of treatment as prevention, as we talked about earlier. And so for the highest risk group, which are people who inject drugs, that's the PWID there, um, testing, drug treatment, reducing transmission from positive partners. And so, um, you know, bringing in even the partner for co-treatment, um, if you're concerned, um, you know, you think about the number of contacts that an individual has, uh, oftentimes um, their networks are fairly small. So if there is a primary uh, partner, um, having them also treated uh, makes a hell of a lot of sense. And so, oh, excuse my language, sorry. Uh, vaccine, unfortunately, we don't have as mentioned, but changing injection behaviors, counseling about, um, you know, um, uh, you know, many ID physicians now when, when engaging patients in hospitals will have patients go over exactly how they do things and see if there's any advice that we could provide, as well as provision of the clean injecting equipment. And even in some um, parts of, of the country, pilots of safe injecting locations, uh, having RNA testing available. Um, now, someone asked about antigen testing uh, that's not yet uh, FDA approved or rolled out, but uh, that could also play a role as a cheaper alternative. And then treatment. What happened in Iceland? Now, Iceland is an island, and so perhaps very different than uh, where we're, we are in the United States. But when they de-restricted use, of, uh, de-restricted access, I should say, to the uh, direct acting uh, antivirals that were available as of 2015, you can just see how the prevalence um, plummeted. So even amongst this, these individuals who are typically given more harm reduction uh, than they are in the United States, so that that is particularly helpful. But you, even if one were to relapse or share equipment, you're less likely to encounter somebody else who's carrying the virus. And so this is the concept of treatment as prevention. Now, unfortunately, um, there, uh, as of 2014, you can see that uh, uh, many states still retain some level of um, sobriety restrictions in the United States. These had um, begun to recede a little bit in 2018, but uh, some states actually moved from, from uh, not really knowing what was going on to adding restrictions. And so abstinence periods uh, that, that were uh, instituted in many, many uh, places as long as 12 months. So, you know, what is the knowledge base of treating individuals who have active risk factors? And so uh, there, there are a variety of trials that could uh, demonstrate this. I'll just highlight this one, as well as go into more detail on a recently published one. But this Simplify study, which is international, looked at individuals who had um, uh, on a with a variety of different characteristics. So you can see that uh, a good proportion of, of these 103 individuals who are people who inject drugs are, are younger, um, uh, decent representatives representation of um, uh, females, but uh, of those in this sort of two by two matrix of those on opioid, the term here is opioid substitution therapy or uh, the same as opioid agonist therapy. So largely um, methadone or buprenorphine um, and whether they're injecting or not uh, at the time of their treatment. Um, and so uh, you can see that, uh, that uh, the majority of these individuals are injecting and in fact, some are, are off um, therapies that that would be predicted to stabilize their use and as well as their hepatitis C risk. And um, they, in this case, there's a, a fair amount of gene type three, uh, but um, uh, as expected with this younger population, um, there, there was lower levels of fibrosis, but use of this 12 week regimen uh, resulted in excellent end of treatment response. That's what the ETR stands for, as well as SVR of 94%. And so that is an excellent rate, and um, uh, and so should be a goal of ours when when finding individuals. So, one uh, sort of issue has been that many of the studies uh, looking at at hepatitis C treatment in people who inject drugs are uh, were performed outside of the United States. And so, um, again, um, thinking through um, how to address this this study, which um, in full disclosure I, I am uh, one of the site PIs. This is a national study uh, looking in eight different uh, states and, and some subsites within each of these eight um, locations. Um, active 
um, people who inject drugs. Now, many of the previous studies looked at six months um, or 24 weeks as a study entry criteria. This shortened it to 12 weeks, so looking at a higher risk population, uh, so ones who had just recently injected. In fact, sometimes uh, the day of uh, enrollment they were injecting. Um, and so on-site hepatitis C treatment was provided, so th this was both in community-based clinics as well as opioid treatment programs, uh, largely methadone centers. And with a variety of stakeholders, uh, I won't go through all of them, um, th this study was informed both in study design and along the way by these, um, these excellent um, uh, organizations. And so what did um, this HERO study do? It um, was funded by the PCORI, and so there, there really isn't a full control arm in this group. They were, I, um, as uh, PCORI studies are typically designed, they looked at something called a modified direct observed therapy. And so, I'm sorry, it's a little small, but this is um, someone at the window of a methadone center. Uh, this is our friends in Rhode Island. And they um, can be directly observed to swallow their, their in this case, the phosphor velpatosphere. There's another route for those uh, who don't want to come into a site every day. There's uh, this thing called EMOCA, which uh, is a way to um, uh, record a video, uh, a secure video of uh, swallowing a pill. And so this was, um, uh, and it also tracked side effects for you. So, um, and the, the other route is uh, something called patient navigation, which I'll go to um, uh, on a different slide. But these are two models that are expected to be uh, enhanced adherence during therapy during hepatitis C and just a comparative effectiveness study that would then look at SVR. There's a longer term study looking at reinfection rates in, in this population. So what is peer navigation? I mean, actually some of your practices are kind of possibly engaged in this on some uh, level, um, just trying to navigate patients into care. It's, uh, but there are formal programs that were adapted from HIV care programs. We're always concerned about HIV adherence and adherence to antiretrovirals. And so uh, these uh, engage uh, philosophies of health education, motivational interviewing, et cetera. Uh, and they, they're really meant to go beyond just hepatitis C, uh, enhance sort of uh, self-sufficiency, engagement in care. And, and here, um, you know, the estimated prevalence of hep C, whether they're aware of it, saw a provider, the so-called cascade of care, uh, the idea is to enhance that ratio along every step. And so uh, actually most of the slides will be clickable. And so um, it, once you receive the PDF, um, you can actually click on this to, to go to some of these websites. And so presented at the ASLD and is currently in, in basically in, um, uh, in review and, and to be uh, hopefully published soon is the HERO study results. And so, um, so I'll, pre I'll present to you what was presented at ASLD at the time. Uh, there will be an updated manuscript shortly. And so this looked at a large number of individuals across these eight, eight different um, uh, places and, and, and various subsites. Um, uh, there were many people who were kind of um, approached or looked, assessed for eligibility, and um, some were missing their hep C viral load test, or um, uh, they did not actually report uh, drug injection within the 12 week period, or some were identified within the 12 week period, but did not come back you know, sort of for uh, an enrollment visit in time. Some had hepatitis C viral load undetectable. So you can see a, a variety of reasons why, uh, although we approach patients, that they were excluded. But once they're in the study, they were randomized and allocated. Um, and so that's really like uh, an intention to um, move along the cascade and initiate treatment. So just, just reaching initiation has been a barrier for many of these individuals who are actively um, uh, engaged in drug use. And so um, just looking at that as an outcome uh, is important. But once on treatment, how well do they do? How well do we get an SVR? And so you can look at it as a trial, uh, as an intention to treat overall, but for the modified treat intention to treat for those who um, do initiate treatment, that begins to look at the efficacy of those who are able to engage. And then a per protocol for those who really did um, uh, go through the protocol who were randomized. And so uh, you can see that uh, there was a good representation, a reasonable representation of, uh, of females um, who are um, very much, especially amongst the younger um, uh, uh, crowd involved in the uh, opioid epidemic. Um, you can see that there was a number of people who were younger than 40 years um, and um, predominantly white with some representation of both um, uh, black individuals, as well as those um, uh, describing his Hispanic ethnicity. Um, largely single, but also you can see the really high rates of an unstable living situation. Um, you can just imagine 
um, uh, you know, over half of individuals, many without transportation. And um, when you think about sites such as West Virginia, which uh, had, um, you know, major sort of geographic issues, um, employment was generally low, and um, you can see genotype one was predominant as we'd expect in a US-based study. Um, most were enrolled in a community-based clinic as opposed to the methadone clinic, but um, many were also receiving methadone um, uh, over 50%, as you can see here. Uh, so some people may have been enrolled at a community-based site who were on methadone, for instance. So that explains that um, uh, discrepancy. Um, and so uh, a good proportion of HIV and uh, positive individuals, alcohol misuse was actually quite high. So uh, another counseling point. So just picture this high risk population with a number of drug injections per day, uh, pretty dense, uh, as well as uh, the majority of individuals having injected within the last four weeks. Uh, and their tox screens were positive as one might expect. And so one can look at this and say, oh, geez, only 60% um, were um, cured through an intention to treat. But when you really delve into these details, what this um, looks at is, you know, there are individuals and we encounter this in clinical practice who are, yes, yeah, I, I want to get treated, I, you know, but then they don't um, uh, eventually initiate drugs. So it shows you this gap, this barrier to care of having individuals who really do want to be treated um, and then not uh, being able to hand them the medication. So that's the first level of the cascade that, that um, did not work. But once you are engaged in care and beginning to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, get through treatment, you can see that once one got through the protocol that it's over a 90% cure rate for this very high risk population. Now, as you might expect, the lower SVRs were associated with certain uh, characteristics largely um, related to the instability of drug use. So uh, being younger, being having unstable housing, uh, buprenorphine compared to methadone actually was a lower rate and the more you injected and the more recently you injected. So you can look at it a different way. So you enrolled 100% of patients that were uh, randomized to either DOT or patient navigation. And neither of those approaches, the extra patient navigation, trying to get patients engaged in initiation, uh, did not seem to um, uh, statistically significantly uh, increase the rates of initiating treatment. 80, uh, almost 84% versus 81%. Um, and then moving on beyond that, you know, who completed treatment? There were many individuals who did not um, uh, uh, complete all the treatment. Uh, some of those actually did achieve SVR in the end, but um, uh, in the end, you can see that, that uh, there's a drop off there. And then um, here you can see the number of people who achieved SVR. And so, um, so this study, um, actually, I, I want to say that this has a positive message that one can treat a super high risk population, but it also reveals that there remain additional um, barriers to care and barriers to move people along the cascade. Now, the, there were really were no discernible differences between the two different models. So uh, having um, some level of either patient navigation or, or um, uh, some sort of observed therapy route, um, you'd argue, well, why not do both? Um, you know, I, that's just the way the trial was, was designed. Um, you can say that over 80% of enrolled patients initiated and completed, and of those, um, uh, many were cured. Uh, you know, many didn't even actually come back for their measurements, and so that's one reason why we don't uh, know their SVRs. But, um, and so I think um, adherence was a bit higher when you looked at it more closely with the M dot versus PN. M dot is the uh, directly observed therapy, which was recording either via that app or uh, at the window. Um, and so, um, and that increased adherence was associated um, towards an SVR. So, um, so we do believe that um, what we do for adherence counseling and et cetera is to, remains important for this population. And we'll look at reinfection rates in, 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 in the future. So, so um, this is US-based evidence in, a, in really the highest risk individuals who are not necessarily very engaged in care. And in many of these jurisdictions really had no access to hepatitis C treatment uh, that one can treat. And so in the final few minutes, um, you know, after discussing prevention, I just wanted to talk about other people-based solutions to um, uh, eliminating hepatitis C. And so uh, one is to engage um, your peers, engage um, uh, people in the community uh, to, and we hear this that say, hey, my friend got treated with for hepatitis C. And so that's why I'm inspired to, to come in and get treated. Uh, expand the provider capacity, reduce stigma we talked about, uh, 
adapt your structures, advocate for change. And so one of the structures that have been built, and this is my co my um, co moderator friend, and uh, Dr. Aronson, uh, the back of his head, um, you can see he's engaged in what's called an echo model or extension of community health outcomes. This was um, really uh, deployed in a lot of places, first demonstrated for hepatitis C in New Mexico, where patients had to travel long ways to see specialists. And so this is equipping local providers to provide the highest level of care um, for uh, and to teach about liver disease staging or whatever questions are coming up and um, you know cases that are bringing up. So it really isn't really telehealth in the sense that um, the central hub here, Andrew is not um, uh, necessarily talking directly with patients, but rather equipping their providers. And the beauty of this is once the providers are equipped, they then share different practices that worked at their site that can be shared with other sites uh, along these networks who are listening in. Other models that have been deployed include um, in, uh, in Philadelphia, Stacey Truskin and others worked via mobile medical unit, um, social media, door-to-door -door outreach to try to enhance hepatitis C linkage to care. Another great model by um, uh, our friend uh, Jennifer Price uh, in San Francisco, uh, and we purposed a, a shuttle um, that can go around and do rapid screening via an oral test for hepatitis C and then do um, uh, testing via blood, uh, do a fibro scan mini device actually on the van for individuals and then counsel and then uh, link to care. Other models are, are working on these mobile care models that, that uh, can then enhance treatment. In our city, they're um, crediting uh, Maggie Beiser, who's led this program, um, a tireless MP. She, she is, uh, this group serves 11,000 homeless and marginally housed persons, many of whom have hepatitis C and have overlap with substance use disorder. And so um, uh, these are internists with hep C ex expertise, and really Maggie is, is the leader in all this. Uh, they did have care coordinator support for the uh, the burdensome PA uh, issue. And then um, they did have high touch inherent. So rather than the simplified therapy approach, this then handing 84 pills over, this is more of a let's individualize, you know, you could check in and pick up a few days worth of meds um, and then check in again, or we'll come out and find you. And, you know, there's kind of a philosophy here of, um, you know, we talked about keeping it simple earlier. Now that in this case, it's like, it's not quite perfect. It's not like um, everything uh, is checkboxed here, but in the end, you can see the various pathways to cure and that um, uh, they were able to initiate 300 individuals. And while a proportion of them did not complete treatment, the vast majority of them actually completed treatment. Some of them did not uh, come back for their SVR, as you can see. Uh, some of them did have um, a recurrent viremia, which some were judged as reinfection versus treatment failure. Um, but in the end, um, these are very high cure rates for such a high risk population. So in the end, like substance use is no longer a restriction. So what I showed you earlier, uh, many jurisdictions um, have um, done away with substance use um, uh, and you don't have to document that you addressed it. But uh, I do think just it's good medical care to still uh, address um, substance use. And there are individuals who may benefit from these intensified groups. So joining advocacy programs, these are some uh, larger national or international projects that uh, one can follow on Twitter or can uh, join and follow and their mailing lists and, and they, um, the Health Center for um, Policy and Innovation at Harvard Law School has been a leading advocate for reducing the Medicaid related restrictions. And now prior authorizations are going by the wayside. So um, uh, some of these states may be a little surprising to you, some of you, but um, some are like, you know, why add the added bureaucracy if treatment is so simplified? And so for many places now, Massachusetts having joined them in the past year, I'm privileged to, to work in a state where at least for naive uh, non people who've never been treated before, a prior authorization is no, no longer required. So I've ran a few minutes over and sorry to eat into the Q&A time, but um, the um, just want to emphasize how there are some um, still some barriers, the silence of hepatitis C, how it spreads via substance use, uh, the social and structural barriers. But I also want to say how safe and effective therapies are available and that simplified algorithms, it's really not the medical piece that's as complicated. Um, you do have to check drug interactions and you know, renal function and a few things, but um, you know, these are things that, 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 that you can do at, um, uh, at, at many practices. And so it is preventable. You know, don't think hepatitis C is inevitable for such individuals and really on a population level, you know, Iceland, showing that, that you can reduce it on a population level. And then even if there are ongoing risk factors, you're less likely to encounter hep C if you're able to, to ramp up treatment.
And so screen, meet patients where they're at, build the infrastructure and affect policy change. These are all issues that resonate with those of us who are involved in the, or, you know, involved in the HIV um, epidemic from decades ago. And so for hepatitis C, we have an opportunity to do the same thing and eliminate together. So let's review the goal set by the World Health Organization for providing treatment for those living with hepatitis C. Is it 95%, is it 80%, is it 60%, or is it 25%? We'll see the answers. 80% is the, uh, I know many of you are still gung ho about reaching 95% and wishing that were the goal. So I think that, um, uh, and so um, let's move on to the second post us question. So um, this is, uh, which of these groups are now eligible for simplified treatment regimen? So um, is it persons with HIV? Is it pregnant persons? Is it compensated cirrhosis? Is it hepatitis B co-infection? I know I reviewed these about 45 minutes ago, so uh, some of you may have joined a little bit later, but let's see what the uh, answers are. Great, so um, many of you did, uh, we went through how compensated cirrhosis, there are now simplified treatment regimens, even for those who uh, have compensated cirrhosis and have not been, um, uh, you know, um, uh, treated before with DAAs. Um, many of you did answer persons with HIV. It does seem pretty, you know, for those of us engaged with co-infection care, you know, pretty straightforward in, in those settings. Um, and uh, the other two settings, pregnancy and hepatitis B, generally uh, one should refer to uh, a specialist. I didn't mention this, but the reason why for hepatitis B co-infection, there are individuals who reactivate uh, their hepatitis B when one cures the hepatitis C. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon that occurs. And so uh, added monitoring uh, and not the simplified approach is recommended for those individuals. But um, okay, so we've reached the end. I'm going to stop my share and uh, turn. I have not been following the, the Q&A as recently and, and turn it back to my uh, moderator, uh, Andrew. All right. Thank you so much, Arthur. Um, what a great talk. That really covered uh, everything you need to know. It was great. Thanks. Um, so I want to get right to, we'll do a little rapid fire and try to get to most of these questions. Um, the first question uh, is a great one that comes up all the time in clinic about reactivation or a question of reactivation of hepatitis C. Um, during in the setting of COVID or even immune suppression of pred, you know something like prednisolone or something like that. Um, so maybe you can just spend a moment talking about whether hepatitis C can be reactivated. I know it can be the terminology can be confusing. Yeah, so I think um, when you think about reactivation of hepatitis C, the way I think about it is there's both kind of a, a potential viral reactivation with an increase in viral load as well as the um, uh, the uh, uh, ALT uh, activation or sort of more um, biochemical or liver injury almost. And so uh, we do see that, um, you, know, you mentioned pred prednisolone with more sustained courses um, of immune suppression of varying types. But in general, um, you know, um, many patients receiving various types of biologics, et cetera, um, you know, their hepatitis C, uh, it's pretty subtle what occurs, I would say. Like, it's not like, people automatically reactivate or, or anything like that. But uh, generally such individuals should be monitored. And it's actually a frequent reason, I think Andrew and I, you know, we, we get referred to these patients, we wanna cure them so they can tolerate sort of um, their immune suppression or their chemotherapy uh, uh, well. And again, um, uh, the, the group at MD Anderson has been um, pretty much universally screening all their cancer patients and, and evaluating them uh, for their hepatitis C. Um, uh, and uh, while many of those individuals do have those poor prognosis, they do find that often 
they can enhance their their cancer care actually through addressing their hepatitis C. With COVID, you know, I think there's there's um, not as much data. I have to say, um, you know, we're we're generally not following these patients long enough, and the the dexamethasone courses are typically ten days or less. Um, uh, and so um, I have not actually experienced this. There is a vast literature of COVID, so I'm, I'm quite sure there's a case report somewhere <laughs> that perhaps I, I don't recall. There's actually a lot more information on hepatitis B, which is a separate topic, and, and uh, sort of mixed data regarding whether hepatitis B reactivates in that setting. Uh, but again, typically the courses of immune modulation will short. I, I saw a co-question in there about diabetes. Um, I think the question went away. Right. Yeah, I, th I think the question was um, effects of uh, hepatitis C treatment on diabetes. The one thing I will say, just to, to just jump on to your last few comments, you know, Dr. Kim is speaking only of people that have ongoing infection. So I think one point of, um, of confusion, mm -hmm. unlike hep B, which has lots and lots of gray areas, if somebody has had an SVR and their viral load is negative and they've been cured of their hep C, they are not going to reactivate in any of those circumstances. So that's that's another a question that that I think people ask a lot. So that would be these are when people have activists. So the other one was diabetes um, <clears throat> improvement of diabetes after a cure and added bonus. Um, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, um, there are some individuals who, uh, if you measure an E1C before and after, there's a subtle effect that's positive. Um, ironically, the, the, the lipids actually, once LDL can, can rise a, a tad as well. Uh, so you'd say like, would you uh, counteract that cardiovascular effect? Now remember hepatitis C actually uses the LDL machinery or, or lipid machinery uh, within the liver. And the liver is a highly, I mean, it's a metabolic organ. It, it handles a lot of the glucose control and, and um, lipid control. In the end, there's some sense that hepatitis C raises one's risk of, of, of active hepatitis C of cardiac events. And there's sort of mixed data as to whether cure of hepatitis C would um, abrogate that's, that perhaps increased signal that we see. Um, you know, there's some potential confounders in those works, but in the end, I don't, I don't, can't really think of a positive effect of hepatitis C, Andrew. Uh, so, you know, removal of it from the body, you know, whether it's uh, for the liver or for these extra hepatic potential issues, uh, I think, you know, I wouldn't want that virus around. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's never really um, much of a discussion of anything good that it's doing. So certainly eradication is always key. Um, this is an interesting question about uh, core antigen for hepatitis C and comparing it to RNA. Um, I know that you had mentioned in your talk that it's not quite ready for prime time, but it certainly is an exciting uh, technology because it, it allows more opportunities for point of care testing when we're thinking about things like elimination. So um, what are your thoughts on uh, this being ready for prime time? Yeah, I think as uh, as regimens have become simplified and, and less costly, I think um, we could think about a model of um, seek, test, treat, and do it really rapidly. And so already many um, places such as Quest have instituted this sort of automatic, you're antibody positive. Well, that's not really the information you need. You need whether they're RNA positive or not. And so they reflex, so to speak, directly to that result. However, RNA still remains costly. And so antigen tests can be deployed in more um, cheaper settings and or in a cheap fashion. And so I do think this is this is the way, you know, as they would say in the future, where you could have some point of care test, say, hey, you have hepatitis C evidence, here's a way to treat you. That's great. Yeah, I think that's um, more to come on that. Um, all right. So uh, another question, this is getting into the weeds, which is always kind of fun. Um, I think I can, I, I'll make a suggestion. Tell me if you agree. A patient with compensated cirrhosis G, genotype three, which you had covered in your talk, uh, Y93H mutation, who's ineligible for, vi for ribavirin, is there data to consider 24 versus 12 weeks of cefosfavir or velpatosfavir? Would you use an alternative regimen? Um, so this is that one kind of caveat where things get a little bit uh, confusing. I think the only time when things get confusing, again, this is only for cirrhotic patients who are genotype three. Uh, if you're going to use cefosfavir and velpatosfavir, the recommendation is to check for, um, for RASs or, or resistance. So 
the guidelines would tell you if they don't, if they can't uh, tolerate ribavirin, then um, then the alternative would be in sofosavir, valpatasvir, and voxelaprevir for 12 weeks for these patients. Um, I ha- do you have any experience or know any data of um, of 24 of extending that to 24? I, I have to admit, I, I I don't know. I mean, I know it's certainly not in the guidelines. I, I can't think of anything that would be convincing. Yeah, no, I. I- I think um, you know ribavirin. Um, we it's still a remnant from our previous era, and I think we we look for ways to to avoid it. So I do think um, what typically happens in our practice is that if we give it a try with ribavirin, we also typically aren't um, as aggressive with it as we were back in the day with interferon, where we felt like we really needed to have uh, more upfront. And so if you do this sort of low dose approach, many patients can tolerate it, but um, when they don't and they have side effects and they or they have anemia, then you know it's a rapid move to apply for 24 weeks. And I think that typically is given. Um, uh, I know in the decompensated w- world, um, you know that we just pretty much go straight to 24. And I think um, uh, you know some some insurers will make you try the ribavirin, but um, uh, you know we we often advocate, hey, there's you know he, these five reasons he should not receive ribavirin. And so sometimes we're successful, but yeah, I think we're extrapolating a bit for, for, um, from that, um, from that data set. Yeah. Um, okay. This is a common thing that comes up. I'm glad it's been brought up. Uh, patients that don't come back for their SVR 12 labs, uh, any tricks of the trade to, you know, cause I think that is a common way where patients can fall off. They take their meds. We don't see them back. Um, what do you do? I, I I've got something, but tell me what you do. Oh, why don't we go straight to your answer just out of time. But, um, uh, we, we have this problem too. I, I empathize with, with the, uh, questioner. Um, it does happen, but Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I had magic. Um, the only thing I will say that has been helpful is I really go over the timing of everything a lot when they're initiating therapy because, you know, this is different than every other, you know, treatment. It's kind of a weird thing to to have to check three months later, and, and that's not intuitive. Most people think they check and then they're and then you know they take their meds and then they're cured. So I try to cover that at the very first few visits when I'm seeing them that this is something and make the appointment. It's not perfect. I mean, I certainly have the same problem as you guys do, but every once in a while it can be helpful. Um, let me, um, I know we, have, do we have a hard stop at uh, 2.15? I'm not sure, or for me it's. Dr. Kim and Dr. Aronson, you're welcome to continue the Q&A if you have the time available. Um, Arthur, are you okay sticking around? Yeah. So we can cover okay, let's, all right. Let's keep so going, let's there's go. some great questions. Yeah, they're really good questions, so I, I'm happy to stay. Um, so we talked about that. Uh, genotype three is a uh, question of genotype three of being evidence for IV drug use. Yeah, there you know it is a more common uh, genotype in the United States amongst people who inject drugs. However, um, without more detailed molecular analysis, there's not really a, a direct way to link that. There's plenty of genotype three that was transmitted, you know, 20, 30 years ago as well. So, so we typically don't read in too much to the genotypes these days. Um, and as mentioned, you know, I think one could even um, uh, forego that. Um, many insurers, I think somebody mentioned that, um, do continue to require genotype on the text, uh, uh, you know, in their um, sort of PAs. Um, but um, you know, nowadays now, without a PA in Massachusetts, we we just proceed if there there aren't a positive recently. So. Um, another question, advice you give uh, if you're encountering providers who do not do RNA testing and how can we make this standard procedure? Yeah, I think that, you know, that, that idea of a reflex test, again, like patients think about hepatitis C, so they order an antibody, they go to their choices in their algorithm, and hopefully, you know, for most individuals would choose that. Just that, that extra step of bringing someone back in for RNA testing often gets dropped, and it's one reason. It just adds a step to the cascade of care to reach the provider. And so, um, but I, I feel you, we often get um, sort of uh, referred someone who's antibody positive without that testing yet. Um, if I can't communicate with them to get it before they arrive, I just do it and still counsel them because many individuals still have some, some messages of prevention and things that I can provide. So I do feel like um, even if they turn out to be RNA negative, that I can still provide some, some significant counseling. That's great. Um... All right, something near and dear to me. Uh, given the broad efficacy, low toxicity of current options, I'm in, 
in uncomplicated patients, why isn't there an initiative to treat in the primary care environment? Uh, there's a parallel with HIV care, uh, which was broadened uh, to MLP and advanced um, uh, practice providers that could model opportunities for curative care in, H, uh, in HCV. I'll just briefly say before turning it back to my moderator um, that we had a, a, a internist at a local health center who wanted to engage in this during the interferon era. And, and so accomplished treatment at his center um, with interferon, a uh, pegylated interferon ribavirin. And then when DAs came along, it was really easy at his center to, to convert some of that. So he developed his own guidebook. I wish he had published about it more because it really was an interesting model at that time. But now uh, I completely agree with you, Dr. Druckmann, that this is the time to advance this at our institution. Um, we have not tried to centralize care. I'm not trying to get all the hep C patients to see me. I would rather equip the local providers to, to do that. What, what model has worked is often a practice develops a champion or someone who kind of really learns this more deeply. They themselves see the majority of patients. They get a few under their belt. And then they begin to teach their colleagues uh, how to do it and say, hey, you know what? Just, you know, here's my checklist. Um, run through this. I can help, you know, give you a little bit of advice. And Andrew is doing this on a larger scale. Yeah, I mean, certainly, it's a, Dr. Druckmann, that's a great point. Um, I, I always say that treating, securing hep C now is harder than starting a new diabetic on therapy, I, I feel like, and as far as, you know, bread and butter things that primary care providers will, will do. Um, so, you know, uh, Arthur had gone over our ECHO programs, but that's what we are doing in Chicago, but that's going on you know, nationwide and even worldwide, which is training primary care providers to treat hepatitis C. There's a number of uh, different platforms. Uh, in Chicago, we've trained about four, over 400 primary care providers, nurse practitioners, primary care doctors um, to treat hep C independently. So um, now that the, the treatment, um, you know, doesn't have all the significant toxicities of interferon and the, you know, all the issues, um, you know, this is this is this is not only a viable option, but I think it's a crucial option to uh, reach elimination because it's, you know, uh, subspecialists are not going to be the answer here if we're as we're thinking of of uh, bigger strategies to eliminate this disease for for the variety of reasons of the importance of primary care. Um, so definitely um, a key a key thing. Um, which kind of gets to the next question, uh, asking about cost of therapy as a major hurdle to overcome. That's certainly something we're not better, but not out of the woods yet. Um, I know, uh, you know, Arthur is from Massachusetts, which is always very uh, progressive when it comes to these things, but still, still an issue, right? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, some uh, jurisdictions um, have, have, tried to be creative. So they said, let's do a subscription model like Netflix. Mm -hmm. So you can binge all you want for one year. We'll pay this fixed amount to the companies and then uh, do our best to get as many patients onto treatment as possible during that year. And so uh, that model um, uh, also is kind of how Australia approached it, for instance, to try to reduce um, the, the, the per patient cost. In the end, um, you know, to be clear, um, the cost of these uh, agents are not what's listed uh, on the internet, that there's um, that they, they are negotiated way down. So in this case, the competition between these two major um, uh, companies has, has worked to reduce that cost. And so, and when you think about um, hepatitis C, I didn't state this, is associated with 20 years of lost life, if you really look at it um, uh, on an overall level. And so why wouldn't you spend that, um, you know, now perhaps around, 15 grand or something to, to uh, reduce um, uh, that life expectancy or to, to try to um, uh, reduce that life expectancy gap as well as reduce, and it gets to a future question about the undetectability of the patient and inability to transmit onward. I mean, that's the other benefit. And so for the woman that we presented, you know, she would, uh, if cured, if she chose to become pregnant later and deliver, then that baby would be at zero risk. Uh, undetectable is undetectable. And as Andrew mentioned, uh, for the reactivation issue, um, uh, you know, once you don't have this virus anymore by SVR, it's gone. No longer in the body. And that, that is very powerful to tell patients. Yeah. And speaking of uh, undetectable, uh, I know that we spoke mostly about hepatitis C and how it can be said that U equals U with hep C patients. This also, just to clarify, this all this is including, of course, acute hep C, but chronic hepatitis C patients too that are cured. So I think I think you kind of covered that, but that's the same concept. Yeah. 
Um, okay, this is a tricky one and the one that I don't see infrequently. Uh, if one had a choice in waiting to start immunosuppressive uh, treatment for another condition after finishing treatment for hep C, but it was still somewhat urgent, how long do you suggest waiting for eight or the full 12 weeks? I guess the scenario that's coming to my mind, I hope that this is um, what um, what the question is, is, you know, somebody is diagnosed with lymphoma and they're um, getting ready to start them on chemotherapy that's immune suppressive or some sort of, you know, this tends to come up oftentimes with, with uh, chemotherapy and immune suppressive regimens. So uh, I'm curious, Arthur, what do you, what do you do? I think uh, a lot of this has to do with the urgency of treatment. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think the, um, firstly, we do have a way to salvage patients. So patients who don't have that, um, that, um, that SVR result, um, there, there is an alternate treatment approach. Uh, they can involve extended courses of the GP regimen as mentioned, or this uh, triple combination of sofosterfer, gilpatasfer, and voxelaprevir. Um, so that um, allows us some freedom in terms of, you know, if this patient really is suffering and needs that treatment, I would treat pretty quickly. I would, um, I would not necessarily wait that long because I, I, have, I have confidence in the cure and I have confidence that I can salvage. So that's basically my approach. Okay. I, uh, I, I agree. Any arbitrary I mean, time on it. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, and I think that, um, you know, it, the best thing to, to do is have a convert, you know, have a conversation with whoever is writing for the immune suppressive therapy. You know, how is this, how aggressive is this cancer? You know, it's, it's, it's a hard answer to say, but you know, it's usually kind of a risk benefit. I've certainly had types of cancers where I said this, you know, the day after you're done with the HCV therapy, go ahead and start the treatment. We're just, you know, when you're talking about a 95 to 97% cure rate, that's pretty good odds um, to not check and not to, to confirm it. Uh, but other times, you know, when if it's like, well, we could start it in the next few months, there's nothing crazy going on, then then it's always nice to to know um, to know that it's uh, cured. Uh, this is a great one talking about, and this is especially as we're getting into treating higher risk patients, um, treatment suspension. Um, so whether non-adherence with therapy, somebody becomes incarcerated, doesn't get treated, you know, insurance issues, whatever it is, um, how would how do you manage these cases and um, you know what, I'm going to put in a, a uh, uh, how, can I enter something in the, maybe I'll just enter it in the chat box, um, the link to the HCV guidelines that has uh, the interrupted uh, treatment. So uh, the participants can can look at that. So I'm going to put, I, I can't put it in the q and A. I I think I'm going to put it in the chat box if that's okay. Um, so go ahead, uh, Arthur. Yeah, so the bottom line is it depends on um, how, how much uh, time has elapsed. And now there's a bit of clues as to um, how you can even restart therapy and just complete the regular course with, um, if you can get an HCV RNA measurement, that can be helpful. Uh, sometimes if the RNA has truly relapsed, you try to um, uh, apply for extension and, and that will highly vary, vary based on um, you know, your insurer and who's uh, paying for these. Um, but but look at the um, link that that Dr. Aronson's providing because it actually does provide some useful practical information and in, for a variety of different scenarios that occur. And as mentioned, um, there are some people who um, we can salvage. I mean, we have these salvage regimens that are uh, also in at least where I practice uh, widely um, available. I think a lot of patients uh, worry that uh, I'll try to answer another question uh, in this too. Um, that you know, they only have one shot at this. You know, they heard I, I I'm one and done, so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, because I, I don't feel like I'm ready in my life yet. Like, but in many places, that's that's not the case actually. When you look at the details of, of treatment, that it's not like you only get one chance at this. And so once you initiate on, them on treatment, you know, a variety of scenarios can occur. They can not come back for their SVR. They can get reinfected, etc. I think um, you know we need to treat. Um, individuals who are at risk for those outcomes. Um, we, we can't um, say, oh, you have to come in for your SVR or I'm not going to treat you. Well, that's a little bit backwards in time anyway, right? So patients may just not show up. But the bottom line is um, you, can, there, you can salvage many situations where the patient comes back, they have the same genotype. You don't even know if they're reinfected or it's a relapse, but you can access the salvage regimen, for instance. Or, you know, there are some patients who interrupt at three weeks and guess what? You check them and they're cured, you know, <laughs> like, whoa, that's good news. 
So uh, there's just so many scenarios when you've been in the weeds of this that, um, that um, uh, and I, we're hopeful that the HCB guidelines website can help you guide through some of those interruptions and things that happen, incarcerations. We have brought the meds to the incarcerated patient um, and um, many of our uh, house of corrections, as we call them, will uh, have systems where they, they want you to bring in the meds. And, um, and so for patients who are at high risk for incarceration, you know, I met, I talk about that during, during the visit, um, you know, we develop a plan, you know, who can we call, who can go get your meds at your home to bring to you, you know, like um, who's your secondary contact. So, so there's a bit of planning for the high risk, higher risk individuals that, that we do have and, and sort of some, some items that we, we include in, in our initial evaluation. And I would emphasize with Andrew, a lot of the evaluations are dynamic too. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tie up a lot of these issues in one rambling speech here, but like um, in adult learning, you got to reemphasize things, right? So Andrew alluded to this earlier. So like, I will try to give them a package at the initial visit, but I will try to reemphasize like, Remember, we talked a little bit about HCV RNA being the important test moving forward for reinfection. They're like, oh yeah, I kind of got that. But reinforcing that at a future visit, reinforcing the need to come back for SVR, Andrew begins that at the beginning, which I completely agree with. You know, this is why we want you to come in then. Reinforce that during the phone call that you might make during treatment. Hey, you know, like we'd love you to come in. We'd love you to know that you're cured and this is the timing of that visit. You know, these are aspects that we just need to reinforce often with adult patients. And I think that's familiar to many of us involved in chronic disease care. Long-winded answer. No, that, that covers a lot of really important things. Um, this is a, a tricky question. If viral load does not subside after eight weeks of treatment, how many more months um, should you go on treatment? Um, yeah, so <laughs> subside is an interesting question. So the vast majority of patients who are taking it well will have an undetectable viral load or this phenomenon of, of detectable, but, uh, but not quantifiable in, in these assays, which are highly sensitive. And so in those individuals, you're like, oh shoot, that's like, um, there's still maybe some viral detection. Oftentimes when you stop therapy, that doesn't come back. It's actually negative when you do your SVR check. So for those individuals, it's actually a not recommended to check uh, at the end of those times. Uh, the times to check in the middle of therapy are, are if they did have that true treatment interruption for more than a few days or more than a week, then you check. But in this case, oftentimes, um, uh, you know, uh, that's a scenario. If they're truly detectable with a big number, it usually means they haven't taken all their meds. Um, so, um, you know, if you're encountering that scenario, Andrew, you're nodding. So I think that that's usually at least what I found. Um, yeah, the, the very vast majority of the time, unless there's some kind of weird drug drug interaction that the patient's having, but that that's my first go to if you're not getting a substantial decrease by like really logs of a decrease. Um, my first go to just like Arthur said is um, have an honest conversation about adherence, um, because that's, that might be, um, you know, that might be, that's your most likely, um, scenario. Um, Dr. Druckmann asks, um, what is a reduction in cost with market competition? I, I've never been able to peek behind, um, that curtain because the, the cost is always something that's not so easy to know, but I don't know, maybe you have some insight into that. No, these are backroom deals that are made between places and, and you know, they're not, they're very per jurisdiction, but they were negotiated down substantially. So, you know, uh, what was once, you know, $1,000 a day or even greater, you know, for the, remember when we were combining Sofosrevir with Semeprevir, two different companies, you know, um, and they did not provide discounts for that, but so that was 150 grand. But now that it's probably one log below that at this point for, for most curative agents. And so, um, so when you model this, even with the higher cost, guess what? It's still cost effective. So you can imagine that if you've decreased the cost to that level, it's really cost effective or even cost savings in the long term. And that's really important when we're thinking about advocacy. And if anybody is interested in that, I know, you know, either of us would always be happy to talk about that. That is a very, very powerful, powerful argument, because uh, even if you don't care about patients at all, you can still make a really good financial argument that this and this makes sense. Hopefully you do. But this is, you know, financially, it always it does work out. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know the HCV reinfection rate in, in Chicago. I, I actually don't have those numbers. Those are hard numbers to 
No, but I, the one thing I do want to just make a quick plug for is I heard a great quote that says, uh, if you're not having patients being reinfected, you're probably not treating all the right patients. And I think what that means to me is that we're in, in just, you know, going on with, with Arthur's talk is that, you know, we're in a position where we should be treating high risk patients. And when you're treating high risk patients, you have to understand that reinfection is going to be part of that. Um, and knowing uh, and having your patients trust you, having your patients being, you know, you're surveying them, you know, with viral loads down the road is, is the, just the realistic approach to this. Um, so, so it does happen. I, I don't have a number. I don't know if you, do you have the public health numbers? Yeah. Area. No, um, but this is an important feature that our surveillance system is actually working to measure this. So, you know, they need to capture HCV RNA because recall that the antibodies are no longer useful to look at reinfection. You have to look at RNA. And so, um, so our jurisdiction surveillance will be looking at post SVR, you know, uh, how many people then develop our RNA. The overall rate, I would say, is low because as um, there are many patients who are. Um, low risk. But if you are engaged in treating at a, at a syringe exchange program, as many programs are beginning, or, you know, the really the highest of the highest risk, uh, the rates are, are surprisingly lower than you might expect. It's definitely not inevitable. And then there are some circumstances where, you know, there, there wasn't enough treatment. Um, like uh, there's one jurisdiction in Hero where, um, you know, everyone else couldn't get treated because of sobriety restrictions. And so you would treat but then, you know, their neighboring person who wasn't in the study, you know, wasn't treated and didn't achieve that U equals U for hep C, you know, where, where they become undetectable. And so I kind of alluded to this in clinical practice, how important it is to treat networks. And so, you know, the best you can to, to do it on a population level. And so, you know, I do think there's this ramp up period where you're treating high risk patients, you know, like, oh, they're getting reinfected, you know, how effective are we? But then you keep treating and keep treating, and then the prevalence drops as it does in Iceland or perhaps Australia or so there are other places that are approaching better elimination targets. Uh, and then you're like, okay, this is this is now we're not seeing as much RNA in your community. And that that I mean, if you think about any infectious disease, that's exactly what you're trying to do. Your other option is to let it saturate out there and deal with all the costs later. <laughs> so I don't really see the um, uh, I, I see the strategy as we, we should push hard in our country to move towards elimination. We clearly have the tools. It's overall cost effective. Um, and we, we need that capacity and uh, the primary care capacity that, that was alluded to earlier. Um, you can do this and um, you, know, you can phone a friend, you could join ECHO programs. You can go to programs like this. You could go to the University of Washington Hep C site, which has incredible modules on each aspect of hepatitis C care, it does take time and effort. But um, I think Andrew would agree. It, it, for the, it's one of the more rewarding things to make the cure call, to call a patient and tell them, guess what? It worked. Your hepatitis C is cured. Here's a little package for reinfection. Here's a little package of counseling to um, avoid future liver issues. But um, it's really satisfying to be able to change that on the problem list from chronic hepatitis C to hepatitis C cured from antiviral therapy. That's great. And then I, I think this is our last question, um, kind of a tough one. Uh, the presentation was mostly about hepatitis C, but in your opinion, would you say U equals U for hep B patients? Um, yeah, so I mean, we... A little harder. We, we, this is a, would involve a, a talk on hepatitis B, which actually there, there was a recent uh, IS uh, webinar, but um, you know, focused more on the global uh, approach to treatment. Uh, we do know that patients who have hepatitis B um, and become undetectable have much lower rates of transmission, either via needle stick studies or through you know, if they're E antigen positive or not, E antigen having higher viral loads. We know in, in the maternal situation that having a viral load uh, much lower than, um, uh, you know, like, let's say it's like 50,000, that it doesn't transmit enough that that we can't deal with it with HBIG and, and hepatitis B vaccine afterwards. So so we don't necessarily treat low-level viremia um, for pregnant women. So basically, there's the lower you get, the better. is generally that um, uh, if you do achieve treatment induced um, clearance that um, uh, you know we do vaccinate obviously their partners to further the risk 
but uh, the risk, uh, you're starting to multiply a lot of fractions. And when you multiply those fractional risks, it really becomes um, almost negligible in many circumstances. Um, so when we're counseling patients who are on therapy and undetectable, you know, that's the, that's my approach is I still take the extra precautions, you know, because I'm, I'm cautious, um, but that the true risk of transmission, I mean, how many times, Andrew, have you met a couple and they've been together a while and they've had, you know, their E energy negative and low level positive and the partner you, you've been trying to conceive, for instance, this is a frequent, so you're definitely exposing each other and yet hep B hasn't transmitted, right? So I think um, this is a, a scenario where the lower you go, the, the better it is. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, gets all of our questions. I think we got through them all. Great. This was a very, um, uh, those questions, just uh, uh, thank you for them. And, and they described the level of engagement. And we hope that uh, we were able to answer them and inspire many of you to go on to hepatitis C care. And, and uh, the audience hasn't shrunk too much. They stayed on for, for the extra, yeah. um, extra, extra bonus 20 minutes of, uh, of discussion. Yeah. And thanks so much, Arthur. That was a really great talk. I, I appreciate it. Great. Thank you to everyone. Great. Thank you, Dr. Aronson and Dr. Kim for sticking around to address all questions that we received from our attendees. And of course, Dr. Kim, for your very thorough presentation. We'd like to remind our audience that evaluations and information on how to claim CME credits will be emailed to you by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's broadcast. Here are a list of upcoming webinars. Our next webinar is scheduled for August 17th, which will provide an update on pediatric care uh, for um, uh, cl uh, clinicians that deal with HIV. And Dr. Kim had also mentioned a um, recent on-demand webinar that we've had um, on hepatitis B. We included that link on the comments section or the chat section. And then here are a list of upcoming courses that we have. We have a September 8th course, uh, which will provide a annual update on HIV management in Los Angeles. And then we also have one scheduled for December 8th. Um, in Chicago, Illinois. This is a reminder to apply for the Ryan White Clinical Conference, which will take place from Sunday, October 16th through Wednesday, October 19th in San Diego, California. Here's a reminder for the Save the Date for Croy, which will take place from February 19th through the 22nd next year in Seattle, Washington. You may access CROI 2020, 2022 materials on the CROI website. And for additional updates for CROI 2023, please visit the CROI website. Thank you everyone. And this concludes today's webinar.